uh, thank you to Hal for reminding me. So if you do not want to have your uh, video showing, or if you have kids and you don't want their video showing, and this will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want your video on YouTube, please turn off your video now. So, okay, officially, good morning. Hello and welcome to the Little Lunch Lecture hosted by the Coastal Land Trust. My name is Stephanie Barrett and I'm the Director of Donor Relations. Um, thank you so much for being here today. We've taken care of a little bit of the housekeeping uh, already, but I did want to point your uh, attention to the chat. There are a few links for recordings of these lectures are posted on our website. And also if you saw this on social media, but you would like to get our e-news so that these come, these announcements come straight to your inbox, please do sign up for e-news as well. Uh, after today's lecture, our executive director, Camilla Herlovic, will be adding a special update to our land protection in Bertie County. So some exciting news happening there. Our speaker today is Nick Lachetti, First Colony Foundation's co-director for archeological research. He will discuss the discovery of Site X and the evidence from archeological investigations, which show that at least some of Sir Walter Raleigh's lost colonists ended up in Bertie County. Nick, thank you for being with us today and take it away. All right, thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> um, I, uh, my little description of this included the, the fact that this was a serendipitous discovery. Um, this was not a uh, archaeological survey by design to look to try and find lost colonist sites. Uh, with that said, begin with um, the location for those of you who may not know where Bertie County is across the Chowan River from Edenton and it is uh, this area is perhaps not coincidentally 50 miles uh, inland from the mouth of the Albemarle Sound which is uh, what John White when he uh, made his report after his return to North Carolina and not finding any of the 1587 colonists. Um, his report said the plan was for those colonists to, uh, to move 50 miles into the main. So this just happens to be about that uh, distance. The property uh, originally was a 1,400-acre farm called Ball Gray, and it was purchased by a developer who uh, planned and got approved by the county to build 2,800 residential units, I think, and a marina, um, but a North Carolina provision and uh, Coastal Area Management Act required the developer to do an archaeological survey of the property to see if there were any significant archaeological sites. And this is serendipity one comes in here. Um, the surveyor that was hired by the developer uh, had worked with a North Carolina archaeologist for several years, a fellow named Gordon Watts, who was a good friend and uh, colleague. And I got a call from Gordon one day saying, we've got this huge survey to do and we're really booked. Can you come and help us out? So we jumped at the opportunity. This is the James River Institute for Archaeology. I am a principal archaeologist there. So yeah, we said, Gordon, we'd love to. And we then went ahead in 2006, 2007, surveyed the entire 1,400 acres what you're looking at now is a map that shows part of the property in every shovel test hole that we dug or our crew dug on the property. And uh, there is a major site that was already known on the property, an Indian village called Medicum. Several archeological investigations had been conducted there in years past. 
So uh, the fact that that site was there was known. But in addition to really identifying the boundaries of Metaquim, uh, several other major sites were found. The BR-245 is actually the site of Governor Thomas Pollock, an early 18th century governor of North Carolina. But 31 BR-246 is, uh, is a small site. As you can see, that's on the periphery of the Indian village. And it was at that site, this is a finger of land. So you can see it's not a very broad or expansive piece of land. But our testing down there, and you can, these are, um, are the few test holes we dug there. And of course we found Native American pottery. We also found these two uh, or three sherds, of, and these are green and yellow glazed pieces of Surrey, Hampshire borderware. And this is where serendipity 1A, if you will, will kick in. In my decades of doing archeology span in Virginia, I was very fortunate to be able to work on a number of first settlement sites in Virginia and do a lot of survey work that identified other first settlement sites. And they always seem to have border wear on in Virginia. So this was interesting, but we, at the time we really, and there, I'm sorry, here is an example of more complete uh, border wear objects. These are all from Jamestown Rediscovery, uh, where there are just mountains of border wear have been excavated at Jamestown. But we didn't really, as I mentioned, make too much of the presence of border wear here because theoretically it's made throughout the 17th century. Um, and the reason is we know that a trader, Nathaniel Batts, was in the area. Uh, Nathaniel Batts, I think all North Carolina historians agree, was the first permanent English settler in North Carolina in around 1655. This 1657 map, uh, the inset says Bat's house, and you can see a little house image right on a creek that is uh, identified as Flett's Creek, which may be a corruption of some word. Nobody, I think, has ever identified a Flett. But that is Salmon Creek. You can see the Chowan River is labeled. And the fact that Nathaniel Batts is in the area and 17th century or border wear can be found in small amounts in later 17th century. We at the time just attributed this to Batts's activity in the area and perhaps trading with the Indians who still remained at Metaquim, although it was a much smaller village in the 17th century than it had been in centuries earlier. So, um, wrote the report, submitted it to the Office of State Archaeology and the developers, and then the recession came and uh, the development came to a screeching halt. Fortunately, I think we all agree. And um, so the report just got shelved and nothing was further or was done further with any of the archaeology that had been discovered at Ball Gray. But here's Serendipity too. And the First Colony Foundation um, also has Native American specialists. And we had been contracted by um, Beaufort County to investigate the site of Sikatan, Native American village. And it is shown on this map, which is Raleigh's map of Virginia or called the Virginia Pars map. And there's a patch you can see down where the Sikatan is located on this map. And Brett Lane, who is a First Colony Foundation board member at the time and working on this project, 
wondered if there was anything under the patch that might be useful in the research that was being conducted on Secatan. So uh, Brent contacted the British Museum who uh, owns all of the John White paintings. And they said, well, we're not gonna pull up the patch, but we will do some scientific examination and we'll see if there's anything under there. And so they reported back to us later that, well, there's really nothing of great interest under the Sikatan patch, but you might be interested in what's under this second patch that's on the Virginia <coughs> cars map up at the end of Albemarle Sound. And there uh, on the left, you can see that patch and what they found underneath was a symbol of a fort. That's the blue paint uh, symbol. In fact, they also found another symbol, paint, uh, not painted, but on, uh, written on top of the patch, which is what you see on the, the uh, black and white one on the right, uh, almost looks like a fortified town symbol. Um, and this is in the very general area of the confluence of the Chowan and Albemarle and Salmon Creek. Now, why uh, someone put a patch over this is still a question of much debate among many of us with no real answer. But the effect of that is this shows that the English had uh, some significant interest in this area. Wait a minute, we found some border wear here, which could date to the 16th century, late 16th century. Let's look again at the artifacts that we recovered from our survey from that site. And what went unrecognized at the time was this not very commonly found artifact. And we found the shirt on the lower left. It's part of uh, something called um, North Devon baluster jar or fish jar. These, uh, these examples here are again from Jamestown Rediscovery. And in Virginia, uh, where there have been a number of early settlement sites that have been excavated, baluster jar is only found on first settlement sites in the early 17th century. So the uh, first colony foundation decided that there is a distinct possibility given the map information, given the border wear and the North Devon baluster jar, that maybe this site at Balgray does not have anything to do with Nathaniel Batts, but is earlier and possibly a lost colonist site. So in uh, 2012, uh, the First Colony Foundation began its first test excavations um, at BR, um, at the, uh, the, I've lost the uh, brain freeze here with the, the site number. And here we are with the test excavations and found um, more sherds of green and yellow glazed borderware, which led to excavation of about seven to 10 days uh, each year, except for 2013, um, beginning in 2014, more expansive excavations all the way, as I mentioned, each year up through 2017 and what those excavations produced. And here's, you can see uh, all the areas that were excavated, fairly substantial area, but again, on a very narrow landform with swamp on both sides. And as you might expect, being on the periphery of this Native American village, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sherds of Native American pottery, but also uh, 
dozens of shirts of green and yellow glazed border wear. Also, more shirts of this North Devon baluster jar, fish jar. So really some pretty strong evidence in, in, was recovered that there is something going on here that predates the time of Nathaniel Batts in North Carolina. In addition to pottery, some other artifacts that could be associated with an earlier uh, activity here. On the left is an aglet, and this is an actually an, uh, an unusually large one, which is early 16th and early 17th century. Aglets are the plastic uh, tip of your shoelaces to keep them from unraveling. But in the 16th and 17th century, a lot of clothing was actually held together by um, uh, cords and the cords had these copper alloy tips again to keep them from unraveling. And we find these on all early 17th century sites in Virginia. And then on the right, uh, two priming pans from a snap-ons. This kind of gun lock is known in the late 16th century, more common in the 17th century, but it, it is uh, developed and employed in the 16th century. So more interesting artifacts that could be uh, related to the pottery aspect of everything. So, we removed all of the topsoil and over, overburden down to this level of subsoil where archaeological features appear. And there were lots of them, but they all turned out to be Native American features. So uh, all of the ceramics were in this mixed in this overburden that also contained some 18th century artifacts. This is a natural landing place that uh, seems to have been the landing for the 18th century plantation that was there. So there were some later artifacts um, in the same layers as the borderware. But uh, what to make of all the borderware? What does it really mean? So we did a distribution to see if it was just randomly scattered across the site or as you can see here it actually concentrated on in two areas. And uh, that suggested to us that it's not random scatter, that there's uh, some sort of activity going on here where the border wear is concentrated. But still, uh, what does that mean? How are we going to say anything uh, specific about what period the, the border wear and the uh, baluster jar date to? Well, we really have to look at Virginia sites. Um, there are very few uh, late 17th century sites in North Carolina because it wasn't really settled until after the proprietary period was established. But because Virginia was established in 1607 at Jamestown, there are, by 1635, over 78 named sites in Virginia. And almost 20 of these have been the subject of major excavations. So we looked to those sites to see uh, how much border wear was found on those sites, when it was found. And uh, one thing to bear in mind as we go through this to look at the analysis of that is how much area was excavated at site X in regard to some of these other Virginia sites. And I didn't have all the Virginia sites put on, but I just put a hand few, I think, that are representative of the fact that in comparison to the Virginia sites, site X is, has been uh, or has very uh, limited area of excavation very, very significantly less than uh, virtually all of the Virginia sites. So bear that in mind. Um, and 
just a few of the Virginia sites um, that date from, were established in 1618 and 1619. Just to give you some idea of the scope of these, this is Flower Dew 100, a major plantation in Prince George County. This is Martin's 100, uh, also 16, established 1618, that had not only this fortified area and company compound, but several suburb sites. Um, this is about five miles down the river from Jamestown Island. Kings Mill Plantation, which is between Martin's 100 and Jamestown Island, uh, also had a number of uh, sites that dated to the 1620s that were excavated. So we have this body of information and then we went and looked at all of it and I'm not going to show you all of the uh, pages of the borderware survey but you can see I think that from these major major sites in Virginia that were excavated you find little to no borderware and from site X with its very minor excavation area, uh, almost 50 sherds of borderware have come from the excavation of Site X, which is only partially excavated, by the way. So what do we do with this? Well, we made a little graph to show the concentration of, uh, along a dateline of where borderware in Virginia occurs. And except for that one outlier uh, with 21, everything concentrates before 1630. And after the dissolution of the Virginia Company in 1624, the Virginia Company of London was the joint stock company that uh, sponsored the colonization of Virginia uh, until the Crown took over in 1624. Things had not been going well. And there may be a change in the supply network that explains why after about 1630. We don't find we Virginia or borderware in Virginia. If we do, it's only in negligible numbers. So we think that this is very strong evidence that all of this predates Nathaniel Batts. All that Borderware at Site X cannot be attributed to Batts' 1665 uh, settlement on, on the other side of Salmon Creek. In fact, Phil Evans did the historical research for this to see if there was any documented English uh, long life settlement in this area before bats, and there there is none. And this is the list that's been put together of various uh, English activities in the area, but they're all sort of survey or expeditionary. Nothing of uh, a site where there would be a settlement where uh, it would last long enough that over seven objects could be broken, which is the minimum number of objects of, of borderware and uh, baluster jar that we have from Site X. So nonetheless, there were still a few skeptics out there that said, well, there was just somebody there that's not documented. Uh, in the 1620s or 30s before bats, um, and so we took a look at this. And one thing about all historic archeology span sites in the 17th and 18th century is that they contain hundreds and hundreds of pipe stems generally. And pipe stems are a very good dating technique for colonial sites because <clears throat> the shapes uh, change shape over time, say change size, going from very small in the very early 17th century when tobacco was very expensive through the 18th century when tobacco was cheap and people can afford more of it and you can smoke more of it in a bigger bowl and this, that means the smoke is hotter so they make the stems longer to cool the smoke 
And the longer the stems get, the narrower the hole in the stem is. And that's, this is a very well-studied phenomenon in, in uh, archaeology. And there's actually mathematical formulas that you can use uh, to calculate the median date of a site based on the number of pipe stems you have for each stem hole diameter. So um, this again, I can't put all of those Virginia sites on the screen, but if you look at them, they are 964 and 864. All of these Virginia sites date no later than 1650. You get a, some sevens and a few sixes. But if you look at site X, one, no nines, one eight, sevens, lots of sixes, lots of fives. The mathematical formulas that have been developed to date sites using tobacco pipe stems. For site X, the dates come out to be 1714 and 1717. So the fact that there are, there's no pipe stem evidence that anyone was at this site in the 1620s or 30s, and that the border wear based on, again, the Virginia evidence indicates that it cannot be related to a post-1655 settlement. Uh, to us leaves only one conclusion, that they, there were lost colonists here, 1587 colonists. And some additional supporting evidence to this is, this is John Smith's <clears throat> sketch map of Virginia. And you can see Jamestown on it and North Carolina is at the top. And here's a, uh, transcription of it. And you can see these two areas where Smith has recorded some information that they obviously learned from Native Americans. And you can see two places where the Indians report seeing uh, Englishmen. And historians have uh, frequently or commonly think that the 1587 colony would have to have dispersed. They would not have all uh, relocated in one place altogether for a variety of reasons. One of those being that <clears throat> this was the time of the worst drought in 800 years in North America. Uh, in fact, John Smith tells us in one of his accounts that uh, an Indian chief from the other side of the James River asked John Smith if he would pray to his God to make it rain because the Indians have been praying to their God and he's not listening to them. So the drought certainly would have had an effect on subsistence and, uh, and the reason why the colonists may have dispersed themselves in various places. But I also want to conclude with before the survey of Ball Gray before the First Colony Foundation <clears throat> archaeological work began, before the discovery of the fort symbol on the Virginia PARS map, a prominent North Carolina historians have concluded from the historical records that the 1587 colony did relocate to somewhere in Bertie County. And these are just two passages from two of the most prominent historians who have advocated this. Um, and there are more contemporary ones, Karen Kupperman being one of them who uh, concur with this and that, uh, that they went to Bertie County and would have had dispersed themselves. So for site X, we agree that it is basically a case of circumstantial evidence, but as the uh, husband of one of our board members who is a judge uh, in North Carolina, when I presented this to uh, a board meeting and I said, you know, I, I know this is circumstantial evidence and he said, 
hey, don't, don't discount circumstantial evidence. People get convicted of it all the time. So it is a prima facie evidence, but a case, but we feel that the only reasonable conclusion based on the evidence of the uh, ceramics and other artifacts from Site X and the historical record and the cartographic evidence is this must be the site of a small group of lost colonists. What are they doing? Living out their lives on the edge of a Native American village? Are they actually an advance warning system to the rest of the colonists elsewhere in North Carolina? Um, shortly after Jamestown was established in 1607, uh, on a piece of land that juts out into the James River, downriver from Jamestown, the colonists established a blockhouse watchtower from which they could see all the way down the James River to warn them of any approaching Spanish ships in particular. So maybe Site X is a similar sort of sentinel site. Um, we're not sure, but we think Again, the only reasonable conclusion to come to is that Site X is a site of some lost colonists, and you really have to make up something to come up with another uh, explanation. And uh, I did ask this at a symposium. Um, here's the evidence. Here's our conclusion. Uh, let me know if you come up with a different one. And there were archaeologists and historians in the uh, in the symposium, and I haven't heard anything from them in a couple of years. So uh, that's the serendipitous story of Site X. Um, and outside of Roanoke Island uh, at Fort Raleigh National Historic Site, um, we think it, it it's the only uh, documented site of uh, Raleigh's 1587 colonists. Not that there aren't others, but at this point in time, uh, that this is the, the first one that's been definitely located uh, off of Roanoke Island. I have no idea how long that took. I don't have a camera in, or a clock in front of me. You're good at the time. That it, it's fascinating. Thank you so much, Nick, for uh, your presentation today. Uh, I would invite anyone who has a question to unmute your microphone and ask it. Now would be a good time if you have a question. I have a question. Go ahead. I'm curious about what you meant exactly by the patches. Could you explain that a little bit more? And also, how do we know that the shards weren't just found by Indians somewhere and taken to that site? How do we know that someone was using them there of English descent? Oh, I'll answer the second question first. Um, okay. The Indians had no interest in English ceramics or pottery. They were comfortable with their own way of food ways. Uh, they never traded for English pottery. Um, metal objects, yes, but it's pretty clear they had no interest in the pottery, in English pottery or European pottery for that matter. The patches, um, would it help if I went back to that uh, image? Sure. Okay. okay, let me go back to that. And Phil Evans can chip in on this anytime. So there are the two patches and They've been, the patches have been known for decades too, um, since uh, the first book on the, on the uh, John White drawings published, published in the 1980s. 
and they mentioned the, that there are these two patches on the map. Um, there are some explanations for why there's a patch that covers the fort. Um, why there's a patch cover down or around the Sikitan area, I have no answer to that. Um, Phil, if Phil could get in on this, because there are the patch over the fort icon may have something to do with uh, several, there were several presentation sets of these paintings that were made to, for potential investors. And at some point they may have been concerned about uh, this information uh, being seen by Spanish spies. There was, um, I will, I forgot to mention that the, uh, the patch uh, over the fort icon, it has on top of the patch as a symbol, it looks like a fortified town. Uh, the British Museum said they really couldn't identify what that uh, symbol was drawn with other than it was some sort of um, organic material and they use the words uh, invisible ink. And there actually was a lot of that going on at that time in, in Elizabeth's court, Queen Elizabeth's court. There was lots of uh, Protestant Catholic rivalries and spying and, and, uh, and, and letters with invisible ink. Um, but if Phil could add to her Can question you, about the patches, that would be good. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, let me just say that well, when, I, when I think of a patch, I think of something covering up a hole. But there is no hole in the paper. It's what the, Brit the British Museum uses the term patch to apply to uh, for a piece of paper that's applied over the surface of the map. And so the blue red fort that Nick showed you was applied to the surface of the map and covered up with a piece of paper. And then on top of that was drawn this other more detailed fort symbol in an ink we don't know exactly its chemical contents. Two things I would add to what Nick said is uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Eric Klingelhofer, is doing some research and reading about Thomas Harriet, the scientist who was with the colony in 1585 and 1586. Uh, him about Thomas Harriet meeting with a chemist in England about creating inks. So this whole story of making inks and possibly invisible inks is not uh, out of bounds. The map that Nick showed you, and to reinforce the issue of espionage and state secrets and spies, the map that Nick showed you of where the lost colonists might have been in 1618, 168, the Zuniga map is, it, it shows there, the John, John Smith map that's called the Zuniga map. That map is an English map, but it's not in England. It was stolen and it was found in the archives in Spain in the late 1800s. And there are documents that the Spanish produced that were stolen and are found in the English archives. So what 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 was going on is people, the Spanish certainly were trying to figure out where they could find the English invading in their mind what the Spanish call Florida. And of course, the Sp English wanted to keep that secret. By the way, Phil is the president of the First Colony Foundation. Any other questions? A question, what is the uh, feasibility and desirability of more extensive uh, archeological uh, investigations now that the site is in state ownership? Well, um, you know, there is a, uh, a principle in the profession of archeology span that you do not want to excavate the, an entire site because you just we destroy it when we excavate it you um so 
we have decided that we feel we have learned <clears throat> as much as we can about the site within uh, the areas we've excavated that we might just get redundant information. Um, being such an ephemeral site as it seems that uh, we might not find uh, absolutely identifiable English features. One of the archeologists has asked me, well, I'll believe it when I find, when you find post holes for an English built house. Well, and I said, why didn't they just live in one of the Indian longhouses? Um, they were actually more comfortable than English houses, as the Jamestown colonists attest to. Um, but uh, it's, it's not out of the question. You have to get a permit from the State Office of State Archaeology to do so. Um, we might that might wait until perhaps there's more data from remote sensing, ground penetrating radar and uh, other sorts of remote sensing, maybe to pinpoint a few specific areas that look like they might uh, be in more informative. But as far as m more major open area excavations, um, we're not planning on it, and personally, I wouldn't recommend it. I would, I would leave the rest of it preserved uh, for the future when things may be able to be done less destructively than we do them now. Um, but that's uh, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. I have a question. Um, with regard to with regard to the patches again, uh, I understand. I think I understand that these are literally paper patches on a map. If that's correct, then I'm not clear on who put the patches there, or if you know who 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 did put the patches there. Do we know? And do we know when the patches were put? Let's bring Phil back. The answer is we don't know who put the patches there. We don't know exactly when the patches were put there. They have been there ever since the British Museum acquired the paper, these documents, in 1865. The ink or the blue grid. Uh, ink of the um, patches and both patches, the watercolors of both patches and the blue red ink of the um, fort symbol. My understanding is that they chemically match the other uh, chemical signatures of the the reds and the blues and the other colors that you see on the map. They're 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 and the paper. Of the of the patches is the same paper of the base map. So you're not getting an 1865 piece of paper applied to a 1585 map. It's it's late 16th century paper. Thank you very much. If there are no more questions at this time, I would like to invite Camilla Herlovic to say a few words about the ongoing conservation of the Coastal Land Trust in Bertie County. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Nick. As you heard from Nick Lucchetti, Site X is an extraordinary archeological site, but it's actually much more than that. It's an extraordinary natural area too. Its conservation resources include a total of a thousand acres of land with bottomland, cypress hardwood swamp, a sandy beach on the sound, and gorges dropping to extensive wetlands. There's more than three and a half miles of frontage along Salmon Creek, where the creek enters into Albemarle Sound. In fact, the area includes lands that are designated as a significant natural heritage site by the state of North Carolina. And most interesting, and perhaps unexpected, is that it has strategic military importance 
as it lies beneath a military training route for pilots who are flying out of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. And in fact, it's that long list of conservation values that first drew the attention of the Coastal Land Trust, because we are not generally an archeological conservancy, we're a land trust. My name is Camilla Hurlovic, and I'm one of the founders of the Coastal Land Trust. And I can tell you that all it took was one field visit to CIDEX in 2016 for our biologist and attorney to realize that this was an extraordinary and very, very special place. So special, in fact, for its conservation values that it immediately earned a place on our list of top 40 projects in the entire coast. And when we learned from Nick Lucchetti and his colleagues about its connection to the Lost Colony and its many Native American and archeological resources and rich connections to Algonquian history and culture, we were even more determined to save Site X. But as you've heard from Nick, it was permitted for development, a residential development. 2,800 acres, that's exactly right. Waterfront development and a 212 slip marina because there's deep water there. Fortunately, because Site X had so many conservation values, we were able to interest North Carolina State Parks in this project. So to make a very, very long story short, the Coastal Land Trust completed the purchase of Site X in the summer of 2017. To save it for development, we took out our first ever loan. We borrowed more than four and a half million dollars to buy this spectacular site. We raised the money to pay back the loan. And in 2018, we transferred this property to the state of North Carolina, which plans to manage it as Salmon Creek Natural Area. But in the teaser that Stephanie gave at the beginning, I wanna let you know that that's not all of the story because we are hoping to purchase an additional tract of land adjacent to our original purchase later this summer. This new tract also abuts Bertie County's 137 acre tract to the north. If we acquire this new 300 acre tract, we will also transfer it to the state so that the state will have more flexibility and more land with which to manage the future use of Site X and the Salmon Creek complex. We hope that these two real estate acquisitions are just the beginning of the story for the Salmon Creek State Natural Area, and that perhaps you'll even get to visit it at some point in the future. In the meantime, as the state's only conservation group focused solely on land acquisition at the coast, we rely on members to help support additional projects like Site X. So we invite you to join us and learn about future events in the area. You can find out more on our website, coastallandtrust.org. And I have to say that in normal times, we usually have a great big party up in Bertie County, either at Site X or in the vicinity. And though we had to cancel this year's event, we hope to have similar events in the area in 2021. They are usually sold out. So if you wanna hear more about Site X and see it, perhaps if we're able to get on there, but certainly hear more and learn more about Site X, we hope you'll get on our email list. We hope you'll become a member of the Coastal Land Trust. Thank you so much for joining this little lunch lecture. Camilla? Yes. Can I ask a question? Do we have time for a question? It's fine with me. Stephanie, what do you say? Sure, sure. Um, I have a dim memory of some site in North Carolina that was under a, a conservancy uh, restriction and the, the legislature actually reversed that and allowed it to be developed. It was a political situation. Are you, have, have you and your lawyer addressed that type of concern in the the legal work related to site X? Yes, the great thing about this particular project is, the, is that because it had so many different values, it is not only subject, it is owned by the state, it is subject to easements, but it is also subject to restrictive covenants held by the United States of America Air Force, okay? So we can say that there will not be development there um, in perpetuity. I mean, we can't guarantee that sea level won't rise and that sort of thing, but there are layers of restrictions on this property. Um, and the, the, the North Carolina Coastal Land Trust has not had restrictions ever lifted by the state on any of the lands that we have protected. Thank you. 
I want to thank all of you again for attending and thank you again to Nick and to Phil for the for the backup answers to a couple of those questions. Um, it's such a fascinating story and we we really appreciate your time to be with us today to share your expertise on this story. The video of this lecture will be posted online at coastallandtrust.org slash lectures and I invite uh, you to check those out anytime you want or to share it with a friend. I wanted to let you know about our upcoming Little Lunch Lectures next week, May 29th. Janice Allen, uh, the Coastal Land Trust Director of Land Protection, will be talking about the Croatan. The title of her talk is Our Forest to Enjoy and Protect, and she will be talking about some of the very special uh, land protection that we have done in the Croatan in recent years and our focus there. And then June 5th, Sarah Crate is the Outreach Director from the Longleaf Alliance, and she will be talking a little bit about that alliance and uh, conservation partnerships to protect longleaf pine ecosystems in the southeast. Hope you'll join us for another little lunch lecture soon. Thanks again for being here and we'll see you. Take care. Have a great weekend. Yeah.